Please welcome to the stage Rob Cervik. Good morning, everybody. I mean, I'm incredibly nervous. Uh, my voice is a little shaky. It's not ALS. It's uh, speaking to you guys. So, <laughs> anyways, this picture is a great picture. This is uh, right when I had my first symptoms of ALS. This is October of 2018. This was at the Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, <clears throat> that athlete there, lifting him up to the equipment, representing Team USA. That was the first time I experienced like struggles trying to be strong with my left arm. <clears throat> right after that competition, I went and checked out the doctors. I got diagnosed with a uh, cervical herni disc herniation. So I got a cervical fusion. Um, gave about a year for that to heal, to realize that I was still getting weaker, and uh, kept pursuing my diagnosis. And <clears throat> then COVID hit. So. Um, October 2018 was my first symptom. My ALS di diagnosis was at August of 2020. So it was a pretty big journey to get there and get diagnosed. Um, but in that time, you find you need a lot of things in ALS. I've had about six different doctors already, um, some better than others. Um, and each one I learned something from. And what I think we need is we need four things in ALS and other rare diseases, I'm, I'm assuming. We need uh, information. We need clinical trial data. We need advocacy. And we need urgency. <clears throat> with information, people with ALS are getting a lot of their information online from other patients instead of from their doctors. At clinic, we need to know we need to know that some people, when you get diagnosed, you need, to, you need to know that some people live beyond two to five years. I am four years into my ALS journey. I'm not dying this year. <clears throat> clinical trials, you only qualify for clinical trials if you're two to three years from symptom onset, typically. It has to be before that. Once you go over three years, you no longer qualify for trial. Currently, I'm pretty much done with any option for clinical trials. Even though if you look at me, I'm still savable. Um, but we need info about clinical trials and which ones neurologists recommend. We need automatic genetic testing. Right now, um, we're discovering so much with ALS um, and the genetic mutations that are involved with ALS. And most of the places around the country, when you get diagnosed with ALS, they're not going to talk about genetic testing much at all, or they're going to do a simplified panel. We know now that you need a complete genome testing for ALS. That should be automatic on your first day of diagnosis. We need a one-page summary of DME and other things we may, need, we may need to consider in the future. We need a one-page summary of contacts of organizations that can help with various things. Team Gleason with power wheelchairs um, and voice, voice to speech um, saving, banking your voice. We need to know those things. I had to figure those out on my own. No doctor told me to go to Team Gleason to record my voice. We need a one page, um, we, need, we need to know the warning signs and things that we need to know when we go to a hospital. So I recently had a friend that passed away from, they say, from ALS. But he went to the hospital, and they gave him oxygen. He wasn't able to off-gas the CO2, so it became toxic in his system. Not every emergency room knows that. We need to make sure that everyone does. We need information about off-label therapies and the willingness to prescribe them. We, m we know they may not work, but if you don't give people something, they are going to find things on the black market like the Dallas Buyers Club in the HIV community. In clinical trials, we need to follow the Morris ALS principles, which set standards for drug sponsors, researchers, organizations, and patients to ensure ALS is equitable. We need to include patients at our scientific conferences. 
We always have patients on your advisory boards. You should always have a patient on your advisory board. It's not about you without you. It's not about me without me. Make clinical trial patient-centric with open labels, EAPs, and low placebo ratios. We need to use telehealth for some clinical trial visits and add more locations to make trial access easier. We need to commit to give patients something back from trials, like full genome sequencing. In turn, we will help boost enrollment in clinical trials so that you can get top-line data out more quickly. And advocacy. I've done a lot of adv advocacy since I've been diagnosed. We want research to help patients of tomorrow, but we also want drug access for the patients of today. First patient our first patient advocacy got ALS research funding increased from $10 million a year to $40 million a year. Second, they got Congress to waive the five-month waiting period to qualify for Medicare disability. Although I'll tell you, it still takes about six months to argue with Medicare whether or not you have ALS when you're going through the process, but that's a different story. Third, patients fought to pass a $500 million bill called the Act for ALS to put drugs in bodies and collect data to advance the science of ALS. That was pretty much a complete grassroots advocacy. And we had three members of Congress not vote yes for it, and 100% of the Senate voted yes for it. Um, and today, this morning, um, Trejalos just got funding through this. So there will be a group of people that get expanded access thanks to this grassroots advocacy group pushing through the Act for ALS. Most neurologists didn't agree with it at first. They only focused on research. But it was one of the top 100 most co-sponsored bills in the last half century. Yesterday, the FDA approved a drug called Amelix AMX0035, now called it was just named yesterday, so I may be wrong, but it's Relivrio, Relivrio. So however you want to pronounce it, um, they just named it something crazy yesterday. I wish they gave drugs more normal names. It took six years, but patients got the FDA to adopt a guidance document where they agreed to exercise regulatory flexibility for ALS therapies, given the critical and met need. This document was the basis of yesterday's decision to approve Amelex's drug. Several neurologists met with Congress and testified at congressional hearings to ask FDA to exercise regulatory flexibility so it doesn't treat ALS drugs like acne drugs. The approval happened because the drug sponsor, patients, and neurologists all worked together. There are some amazing neurologists out there that are doing so much to help fight in our advocacy world. But we need all of our neurologists to be that way. As a neurologist, you should be on top of that. There's just no other way. You have to fight for your patients. Finally, urgency. In the ALS community, we call it the ALS clock. We need everyone involved to move with the same urgency as, for, as ALS acts on the body. Triage ALS like we showed up as a level one trauma patient in need of surgery. Drug sponsors and IRBs at institutions that run clinical trials need to get IRBs triaged for diseases that are imminently life-threatening. The FDA must approve drugs with urgency. The average right now is 15 to 19 years for a development of a neurological drug. Keep blocks of appointments open. This is really, really important, guys. It took me six months to get in to see a doctor. Keep blocks of appointments open for new patients so people don't need to wait that long for a diagnosis or a referral. You guys should always have a spot open for a new patient. So that's my, that's my, that's my speech. We need urgency advocacy, information, and clinical trial knowledge. If we get these things, I think we can make ALS a lot more pleasant for us that are living with it. And by the way, I'm, like I said, I'm not dying from ALS. I'm certainly thriving and living for ALS. Thank you, guys.